You might have been in this situation too. You're walking down the street, minding your own business, when from the person in front, a cloud hits you. A huge mist, not of tobacco, as you might usually expect, but of sickly sweet raspberry or bubblegum flavour or synthetic cookie. It seems at the moment you can't move for vaping. Sales of disposable vapes are booming. Multicoloured, multi-flavoured, low-cost, highly addictive and, crucially, disposable. Everywhere, vape shops are popping up with row upon row of the garish, multicoloured things. And vapes are attracting more than just people who are looking to give up smoking. But are they as innocuous as they seem? The consensus is it's almost definitely not as bad as smoking, but quite how much healthier, it really does depend who you ask. And as more and more young people get into it, should there be better regulation? The Chartered Trading Standards Institute has called for urgent support from the government with extra staff needed and tougher penalties for retailers selling to under 18s. You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Luke Jones. Today, how vaping took over Britain. I'm Josh Glancy. I am special correspondent for The Sunday Times. Are you a smoker? Only when I've had slightly too many drinks. Okay. Had you ever vaped before? Not really. I did actually have quite a strong affinity for shisha pipes when I was a teenager. Oh. Because I picked one up in the Middle East. And then I discovered that they were actually drastically bad for you. But committed as I am to the trade of journalism, I decided to actually take up vaping for this piece. So I just went to my local vape store on the Kilburn High Road in North London and bought myself a couple of elf bars. One was blueberry, raspberry, one was strawberry. I think I preferred the former and just started puffing. I mean, just do it straight away. It's unbelievably easy. It's sweet and alluring. And, you know, within a day or two, I was vaping quite regularly. Tell us about some of these shops in particular. We'll all have seen them on high streets right around the country. I've never been inside one. What's actually on the shelves? What's on offer? Vapes are on sale pretty much everywhere now. I mean, on every high street, you you have dedicated vape shops where you'll have just a, a quite a dizzying array of different brands. Unlike cigarettes, they can be marketed freely with colours and pictures and cartoon images. And some of them will have been modelled on familiar sweet brands such as Skittles. You'll have permanent vapes and then you'll have disposable vapes, which have a limited amount of puffs, then you chuck them away. So it's kind of a whole... Mm. subculture in a way. But what's fascinating is that these aren't just on sale in specific vape shops. They're also on sale in my dry cleaners, in the grocery store, in the hairdressers. I mean, there's really good margins to be made on this stuff for people. So really everyone's cashing in at the moment. And they've all got strange names. What's an elf bar? What's a geek bar? And what on earth is the difference? Oh, Luke, you haven't tried an elf bar yet. Gosh. I've barely lived. You've barely lived. Um, the Elf Bar is, is the kind of market leader at the moment in the disposable category. Disposables came into fashion about two years ago and have really mm. taken over vaping, made it much more accessible, much easier. So an Elf Bar is a small round cylinder, like most disposable vapes, has 600 puffs in it. They often come in sort of fruity flavours. It's my favourite of the vapes I've tried, just in terms of taste. It's quite slick. It's got a kind of matted colour texture and... They're just extremely popular. I read somewhere that they were selling 2.5 million elf bars in Britain every week. Every week? (laughs) I read that somewhere, but they've got into trouble because an investigation showed that actually the nicotine levels in them were 50% higher than the legal limit in some of these elf bars. So you're supposed to only have 2% nicotine. These had 3% nicotine. Some of the big supermarkets have been taking them off their shelves. That's just the most popular. There is, frankly, an enormous array. There's the Elux, there's the Random Tornado, there's the Geek Bar. It goes on and on. What do they actually look like? Because I've only ever seen them through the window of some of these shops you see everywhere. The actual vapes themselves, they vary quite a lot in shape. A lot of them are are kind of small round cylinders. They're made to kind of mimic the the shape and feel of a cigarette. Others are square or squat. 
Uh, you can get quite big ones, quite sort of meaty, more sort of technical looking ones. So they do vary, but your classic disposable elf bar or geek bar tends to be a thin cylinder, quite easy to hold, quite easy to store. Although I did wonder mm. about the hygiene because I sort of store it in my pocket Ooh. and then you suck on it. And so it's not hugely hygienic. It's like taking your car keys out every so often and licking them, isn't it? Uh, yeah, when you put it like that, uh, yeah. <laughs> Hygienically speaking, yeah. It's also terrible for the environment. So obviously these have batteries in them, these disposables. So mm. you are supposed to dispose of them in a battery bin. Well, I can assure you people aren't doing that. So you start to see them dotted around the floor. If you're in schools, people will chuck them in the playground. They're also just not being recycled properly. So there's a huge amount yeah. of waste of lithium going on, um, which is a mounting problem too. So there's a limit on how much nicotine some of these can have, and then also how many puffs you can get from each one as well. Those laws exist. Yes, they do. And, and that's to protect, partly children, protect anyone from them, because the limit now is 600 puffs. I have seen vapes with up to seven or 9,000 puffs. That's the equivalent to well over 20 packs of cigarettes in nicotine terms. So you get your hands on one of those. By the time you finish it, you're probably going to be hooked on nicotine. They're quite powerful tools in that sense. So there is a strict limit. The vaping lobby in this country says it's too strict because what's happened is because of the strict limit, there is a huge and growing undercover market for mm. supercapacity vapes. And it's become a bit like the illicit tobacco market. You have to sort of know what to ask for and how to present yourself in the shop. And then you can kind of buy the under the counter yeah. stuff. Is it quite an expensive habit to have as compared to smoking smoking? Well, a pack of Marlboro Lights in a London newsagent's now is about £14. So vaping is probably cheaper now with the rise of disposables. You can buy an Elf bar for about four quid. It sort of depends how much you're going to use it. It's obviously highly addictive and mm. the flavour is quite sweet and appealing. So it sort of depends how much you vape, but you could mm. probably do it cheaper than certainly if you were smoking straight cigarettes. That's a very expensive habit too now. And it's so popular now in the UK and also in different parts around the world as well. But vapes actually haven't existed for that long, have they? It's quite recently that they were invented. Vapes only really arrived here in Britain about 15 years ago for the first time. They were invented by someone called Hon Lek, who is a Chinese pharmacist. And he had a very serious smoking habit and his father had died of lung cancer. So he feared his fate and he invented mm -hmm. the e-cigarette. And they sort of first came here in about 2007, but they really only took off here in about 2011, 12. I and mean, that's when I first remember seeing them. Mm. And then even then, they were relatively niche. I mean, my best mate's a lifelong smoker and is always trying to quit. And he got into them quite early. But I would say they've only really become ubiquitous in the last two or three years, I would say. And why in the last two or three years? Well, it's particularly linked to the rise of disposables because before disposables, you had to spend 30 or 40 quid on a vape. You had mm. to charge it. You had to fill it with the liquid. It was a bit of a palaver. The disposable just so easy. I mean, you buy one, you take the plastic top off and you just start puffing it and it just happens mm. instantly. And it's so, so accessible and cheap. But also just the market's grown and grown. These things are all made in China, mostly in Shenzhen. And as I said, it's a marketing free for all. And so they're absolutely going for it. And it's also the case that our government, our health authorities, and many of our doctors have encouraged the sale of vapes in this country as an antidote to smoking. Our official advice in this country is don't vape if you can avoid it. But if you smoke, then mm. absolutely vape instead. So the logic is it's not healthy, but it's healthier than smoking tobacco cigarettes. That is the logic. It's certainly as far as we know, far less carcinogenic. So you're much less likely to cause cancer. It doesn't have tar and all the, the associated mm. perils of tar. But the medical consensus on vaping is not set in stone. And if you ask 10 different doctors, as I did, you get about four or five different answers. So there may be hidden risks in it. There may be mm. longer term risks. The way We don't have any 30, 40 year studies on vaping. It took yeah. about that long for people to realize how bad cigarette smoking was for you. So there are some doctors who are really, really worried about this. Most are fairly sanguine. Have vapes actually been useful in getting people off smoking actual cigarette cigarettes? 
That, again, slightly depends who you ask. There are definitely people mm. who have quit cigarettes through vaping. The number of people is, it sort of depends which data you look at. But Public Health England are pretty confident that it's made a significant dent because we have seen smoking numbers drop massively in this country. Only 13% of people smoke now. That was about 20%. 15 or 20 years ago. Now, part of that is the smoking ban, hmm. but they do believe that vaping's made a big dent. I think the question they have with vaping is you're still hooked on the nicotine. So hmm. your ability to backslide into smoking cigarettes is quite high. And I've seen that happen with people. But pretty much everyone is now concerned about youth vaping. And there's a consensus building about addressing that quite seriously. Because that has really picked up the number of even under 18s who are vaping and are writing saying they shouldn't even be vaping legally. No, they absolutely shouldn't. But about eight or nine percent of them do. And that's grown massively. It's an absolute epidemic in schools. I was talking to a lot of teachers who now spend a lot of their time monitoring the public parts of the boys lose, which is the, the go to place to vape. Um, if you go to the boys' toilet, it's like a shisha lounge inside there. <laughs> where, where all the, the urinals are, there's probably about 10, 20 people standing there, everyone's vaping. If you go in there, the first thing you're going to see is smoke. You can normally smell it from outside. It's more of a social place. No one goes to toilet to actually go to toilet anymore. It's just a vape. Confiscating vapes, suspending kids, talking to parents, trying to track down who's dealing the vapes. It's just everywhere. And you see the disposables clogging up the loos. And I think one school had a £12,000 plumbing bill from disposables. A couple of teachers I spoke to said, well, you know, it's a pain. But in another era, I might have been worrying more about cigarettes and, and cannabis, hmm. which obviously still exist. But vapes have, have taken over some of that space. So they said, this is how kids are naughty today. All my friends vape, yeah. All of them. All of them, every single one. When I was back in high school, like, there would be like first years, second years, people that are like 11 or 12 walking around with vapes. The real worry is there are kids who would have smoked anyway, hmm. but there'll be other kids who wouldn't have smoked, but will vape because of the marketing, because of the fun flavours, because it's so kind of cool and accessible, and may end up then going on to smoke cigarettes later in life, or just hooked on nicotine when they really didn't need to be. So, Josh, we know lots of people are vaping, but there's concerns on a legal point on two fronts that, A, that there are some vapes that people can get their hands on which have way more nicotine than they should legally have or, you know, way more number of puffs in a disposable one than they should legally have. And then the other point is that there are also kids under the age of 18 who are buying these as well. So it's a bit of a wild west. And you've been to the frontier, so to speak, on <laughs> the Uxbridge Road in West London. Yes, I decided to sort of investigate the illegal side of this with a trading standards officer called Doug Love, who is the chief trading standards officer for Hammersmith and Fulham. We went out on the Uxbridge Road, which is the kind of main thoroughfare through Shepherd's Bush and has quite a sort of wide variety of, of things on it. And as we arrived to the Uxbridge Road, Doug immediately separated from me. He said, oh, I'm known here. He said he reckons he's raided 27 different shops on the road, not just for vapes. So I separated from Doug and I went into a vape shop that he thought was a likely candidate. And what was the plan with him in terms of what you were needing to do and what he was going to do? What was the mission, Josh? Right. So what, you've watched The Wire, I presume. Yeah. So you can imagine that there's backup, there's signals. <laughs> no, it's, it, was, <laughs> it was pretty simple. I basically go in and try and get them to sell me an illicit vape. And then once they do, I come out and I wave to Doug and I sort of wave it in the air to him. He's the heavy cavalry. So in this shop that you went into, what was he telling you you needed to say? What was the code words that people would use to get this kind of stuff? So I tried a couple of different approaches um, in different shops. Sometimes I sort of peruse very casually and expertly and then say, oh, do you have anything a bit stronger? Or do you have anything a bit bigger? But then once I started to get the hang of it, I realized actually if you mentioned certain brands... So if you say, do you have a random tornado or do you have an Elux 3500, that shows you really in the know. So hmm. in this first shop that we went to in Shepherd's Bush, I said, do you have an Elux 3500? And the guy looked at me, nods, he opens the till, lifts up a stack of tenors and picks out an Elux from underneath them and hands them over. 
then Doug comes in and basically turns the shop upside down and mm. seizes whatever illegal stuff is in there. And they're everywhere, these things. They're under the till, behind a little metal panel. They're in random boxes. You know, they're just coming out of every sort of nook and cranny of this shop. And we end up with a mound of about 30. Almost as if your man wasn't so concerned about hiding them. Is that fair? Definitely, because Doug has raided the shop before and he can prosecute them, but realistically he's not going to unless they repeat offence several times because it's just a massive effort for him to prosecute. Costs money. Mm. So what he does is write them a very stern letter and he walked in, he was like, I've told you three times and <laughs> sort of kind of shaking his head in frustration. But realistically... The guy looked a bit sheepish, but, you know, he had his stock taken, fine, mm. but nothing more than a rap on the knuckles, we don't think. So it's a bit of a game of cat and mouse, but they're not taking huge risks with this stuff. And the margins are very high. You can make three to four times your money mm. on this stuff. And how illegal it is an Elux? Was it 400, 500? 3,500. That's how many puffs it does. How illegal is it? I mean, mm. theoretically quite illegal, but they're everywhere. It's kind of cool to get your hands on one. There's just such a glut of illegal vapes of all different types. And it's such a sort of poorly regulated and poorly controlled market that Doug is like sort of King Canute, really, trying to sort of hold back the tide. Mm. And he must get frustrated in that if he keeps going back to these places and it's the same problem in the same shops again and again and what there's just little that he can do about it that's of value to the local authority? What really troubles him, actually, is less the capacity, the illegal capacity vapes, and more the underage sales. He's actually sent his own teenage daughter in as a test purchaser to see if she'd be sold to. Because the real problem here is this stuff getting into the hands of kids and the speed at which they then get hooked Hmm. onto it, and then the cost of that and the potential effects of that for their health. And is that a given that a 15, 16 year old can go into one of these shops and more likely than not, they'll get what they want? So the Chartered Trading Standards Institute gave me a stat that said 40% of attempts to buy vapes by 16 year old test purchasers were successful. So that's pretty high hit rate. Mm. And are the illicit vapes becoming more and more common? Yeah, they're everywhere. Uh, I think you can just get them online as well if you know which websites to go to because they're so easy to get in the country you know you get these huge stacks coming in from china via europe on lorries coming into dover and elsewhere most of them will be legal some of them won't new brands coming out every few months Mm. no one's really got a clue what's what's going into the country and then you've also got organized crime gangs getting in on the act because i said the margins are big here so in manchester they've been finding warehouses with huge caches of this stuff run by some of the gangs in Cheatham Hill and Strangeways in Manchester. So it's a pretty complex picture. Now, this illicit side of vaping, of course, takes away somewhat from the image that has been portrayed about it being a healthier alternative to smoking. Do we know actually how less harmful it is and how big of a problem it could be. Well, yeah, this is where the whole story gets quite contested. There's no real evidence of of major carcinogenic toxins in vapes. There's certain concerns about the heating pipes and the kind of metal coils, and there's flavorings that have been signed off that we have in our food that we don't necessarily know what happens when you inhale them. There's research that's been done in America about the cardiovascular effects, which could be quite bad. There's definitely a point that's been made a lot that if you vape and smoke, which some people do if they're trying and failing to quit cigarettes, Mm. you really are maybe getting the worst of all worlds there. I think the consensus is it's almost definitely not as bad as smoking, but quite how much healthier it really does depend who you ask. And even in Britain, Scotland has now become more anti-vaping than England. There's now a bit of a kind of face-off between different experts in those two countries Addiction specialists are very more pro-vaping. Cardiovascular specialists are more sceptical. You know, it's like there's different camps and there isn't a clear consensus yet. Are we a particular outlier in terms of how other countries are dealing with this? Because this must be a problem elsewhere if it's a problem here. We are 
definitely more on the pro vape side of things, along with New Zealand and a couple of other places. In Australia, for example, in Denmark, in Norway, they have a lot of bans and regulations. About 40 countries around the world have vaping bans. Some places don't even allow you to sell vapes with nicotine, only without. So I think we are becoming a bit of an outlier, yes. Is it right that you can't buy them in China, even though that's where a lot of them come from? Almost all of them come from China. You can buy them there. I don't think they sell them with all the addictive flavorings. And they've been quite careful, as they have with TikTok, to limit the exposure of their own children to the sort of more toxic aspects of it to make sure that they don't get as addicted. So <laughs> you know, it's a bit like a sort of low-key reversal of the 19th century opium trade. They are exporting this stuff happily, but being a lot more careful <laughs> domestically about what it does to their own population. So that probably tells you something. There's clearly a problem. That's why you were out on your Jimmy McNulty mission <laughs> in Shepherd's Bush. And we know that Doug clearly hasn't got what he feels he needs to properly get on top of the problem. Is there a call for even harsher restrictions or controls to try and get on top of this? It's coming. There's actually a, quite a big conversation happening now in Westminster. The message has got through, I think, because enough parents have seen their kids on this stuff and got pretty anxious. I think the real crackdown will be on underage vaping. Maybe that means bigger fines if people are selling to underage kids. I think there'll be a crackdown on packaging because that's seen as being deliberately targeting teenagers, basically, with the sort of sweetie, cartoony packaging. My sense is it will end up not that different to how cigarettes are now. You may not have the pictures of rotting lungs and open mm. throats or whatever on the packaging, but I don't think the sort of blaze of colour and, and marketing is going to be sustained. I think we're going to see it really be cut down to size. But there's a question of fines for people who are selling them to underage people. There's also the question of just maybe, like has happened with cigarettes, higher government taxes on them. But we know that the, the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has rejected calls ahead of the, the budget to actually put a levy on single-use vapes. Do you think that would be of any, any use? Is the fact that they're so cheap actually helping them fly off the shelves? Yeah, absolutely. Particularly for kids who obviously have budget limitations. I think Hunt's trying to stake out a bit of a middle ground. I interviewed the Deputy Chief Medical Officer and she said to me, you know, for her, the, the big problem is still smoking. Six million people in this country still smoke. Tens of thousands of the people die preventable deaths every year from smoking. So she still sees vaping primarily as a tool to address smoking. That doesn't mean she's not concerned about youth vaping. I think she'd probably support the same regulation that, that we've just talked about. Mm. But she doesn't want to regulate it out of existence because the net benefit for the country and for society and for our health service, if you can get hundreds of thousands of people off cigarettes with this stuff is big. Mm. Now, there is a debate also about how effective are they at getting people to permanently stop smoking. The data there is contested too. One of the things that definitely a few decades ago really drove smoking numbers was how cool it would look to many people. Do you think vaping could ever have a similar situation going on, even with people who are a lot younger? Because to my mind, it isn't at all cool. So... I'm inclined to agree with you. I think it's quite naff, actually. Mm. It's just very unchic, you know, the LED lights, the sort of battery-powered aerosol. One could never imagine having a poster of Audrey Hepburn vaping. <laughs> uh, it just wouldn't be sexy. But for kids, it's the sort of gaming aspect to it, right? It's a bit techy. It's a bit like having AirPods and playing Fortnite. It sort of almost straddles gaming and drugs, yeah. if you like. I don't think many adults think it's cool, frankly. I think most adults know that they look a bit lame. And for that reason, I, I do think just its aesthetic failings will hamper the uh, permanent mm. popularity of vaping. Whereas, say what you like about smoking, I mean, it's a terrible cancerous thing to do, but it does look quite cool and we sort of all know it. Josh, you said you took up vaping for the purposes of, of this. Have you kept it up? Yeah, this was my attempt to being sort of poor man's Huntress Thompson. <laughs> yeah. I took up my elf bar. Uh, I got quite into it. It does get, you know, the habit forms really fast. I compared it to checking your phone. It's mm. just something you start to do when you're slightly bored and don't want to have to sit with your own thoughts. And 
the nicotine, you know, is powerful. And, you know, if you get a, a flavour you like, it's very pleasant. It's very nice to punctuate a walk. So I did get into it. I have quit, you'll be pleased to hear, because I've not never been a smoker, really. So it's a bit pointless to become a vapor if you can avoid it. But, you know, I wouldn't say no if someone offered me one. You've been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times, with me, Luke Jones, and my guest today, special correspondent for The Sunday Times, Josh Glancy. As a very special correspondent, Josh writes on all manner of topics, and if you're a subscriber, you can read the lot at thetimes.co.uk. Perhaps you might be interested in his recent trip to Oxford to meet the people working on the ethics of artificial intelligence. I know I am. The producer today was Edward Drummond. The executive producers were James Shield and Kate Ford. And sound design was by David Crackles. Leave a review if you wouldn't mind. A nice one helps other people find us. Goodbye. Goodbye.